So then we'll continue with the opening remarks. <coughs> but we'll start with uh, Dr. Do, who will give his uh, uh, presentation, and then uh, continue with uh, Dr. Halgor after uh, after that. Thank you, Dr. Hans. Just get this one a bit further up. Okay, so I'm gonna convince you that migrant attacks are of peripheral origin. So when we talk about the origin of migrant pain, usually the discussions are related to these three topics. Does migrant attacks happen outside or inside of the brain? And of course I will argue that it happens outside of the brain. After we go through that, well then we have to discuss what tissue are we working with. And usually here, we have a choice between vascular tissue or neuronal tissue. And if it is the vascular, well, how do we go from vascular signaling to actual pain perception? And after today, you will understand all these three topics. <laughs> okay, so the germinal vascular system is widely recognized as the anatomical and physiological, physiological sub substrate of migraine. This framework has both structures within the blood-brain barrier and structures outside of the blood-brain barrier. So the question is, where should we look when we, need, when we are discussing the origin of migraine attacks? Well, if you ask patients or clinicians what migraine patients usually want to get treated, what is the hallmark of migraine? It is the pain. Patients come to us to get their pain treated, and usually this is also what our medications focus on. So when we're talking about the origin of migraine attacks, we're actually discussing, well, where does the migraine pain originate from? So, we can look at the anatomy of the skull. Already, quite some decades ago, we had an idea of where to look. Where are the pain-sensitive structures within the skull? So, in this study, in this study from 1940, they had patients that were awake doing neurosurgery, and they stimulated different structures of the brain and the surrounding tissue. An interesting part here is that stimulating the pancreas of the brain, the actual brain tissue, does not generate pain. But stimulating the structures around it, in particular the arteries, generated pain. And not just pain, focal headache related to the side. So already back then we had an idea, okay, the nociceptive structures of pain of the headache are not inside of the brain, they're surrounding or outside of the brain. And this was reproduced a few years ago. So it's not because the did some in 1940, we actually reproduced the result later on. So we are quite sure that the nociceptive structures are outside of the brain. So we know this now. So not only are the anatomic structures outside of the brain, we also know that the migraine pain itself is associated with vasodilation. So we have data demonstrating that during a migraine attack, that is a vasodilation incidental to the headache side. So what we see is that at baseline, well, nothing is happening because nothing has happened yet. Then during the attack, that's a vasodilation, the vessels expand. And if you treat it with sumatripsum, a common migraine treatment, you also see a vasoconstriction. Now, Anas will probably say this is unfair. We know that sumatripsum constricts the vessels. But I'm just saying that vasodilation is both associated with the pain and the pain relief. So we have an idea of that vasodilation is associated with migraine pain. We have an idea that the pain related structures are outside of the brain. So, okay, we know now anatomically we are probably going outside of the brain. And the next argument is that, well, that is the pain, but what about provoking the actual attack? Because the pain is a symptom of the attack. Well, we can actually provoke attacks by purely peripheral mechanisms. So most migraine patients will reportedly have at least one trigger. Alcohol is one of the most common of them. And usually, well, you don't have to have migraine, but you can usually have a reaction like this the day after, right? So what you can do is that you can look at what can trigger a migraine attack and then have an idea of, well, if this molecule can trigger a migraine attack, then most likely it's mechanisms and involved in migraine, right? So over the years, we've given different substances to patients. In this case, CGRP. This is a G-protein coupled receptor, and the yellow part is CGRP. 
and this provokes migrant attacks. Now, why is this interesting? Well, because the CGRP we give is given intravenously, and the molecules are too big to cross the blood-brain barrier. So we know for sure the site of action of these molecules, at least these new peptides, are outside the brain, but they're quite potent migrant attack generators. Now, a counter-argument here could be, well, some people have speculated that the blood-brain barrier may, might have a little dysfunction. It might be uh, leaky or have an increased permeability for these molecules in patients. But actually, my colleague here, Dr. Huber, actually demonstrated with some colleagues from the Danish Genetics Center that the blood-brain barrier is in type due migraine attacks. So this argument does not hold. So basically, we can provoke attacks through purely peripheral mechanisms. Now, the next line of argument will then be Okay, we have the anatomy, we can provoke attacks. And the third argument would then be, can we treat attacks through peripheral mechanisms? And yes, we can. Recently, monoclonal antibodies targeting the CGRP second pathway, either the lichen or the receptor, have been introduced to uh, micron prevention. And the interesting part about these antibodies are they're highly efficient and they are extremely large molecules. They're even larger than the neuropeptides as discussed earlier. And these can definitely not pass the blood-brain barrier. So again, peripheral anatomy, peripheral trigger, peripheral treatment. So if you ask me where migraine attacks originate from, it's not in there, it's outside of the brain. So overall, in favor of peripheral origin of migraine attacks, we have the pain or the nociceptive structures are outside of the brain. That's the first one. Second, you can both provoke and treat migraine attacks purely through peripheral mechanisms. And third, and be aware, neurovascular, vascular neuronal in terms of migraine. Again, pain sensitive structures or the nociceptors around the vessels. So it's more likely vascular neuronal than neurovascular. This is common for the nerds in here. And then, again, the blood-brain barrier is intact due to migraine attacks. So that is not a valid argument. So overall, again, anatomy, provocation, and treatment points in which direction? Outside of the brain, a peripheral origin of migraine attacks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I see you're already getting a bit dirty here using your opponent's research to prove your point. But uh, let's see if he is able to uh, fight back. <coughs> is the sound on? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, you know, I really I like my opponent and colleague here very much, and uh, I really want to be gentle on him, but I also have to present him with some really hard and cold facts here. And I have to remind you that the question here is, what is the origin of migraine attacks? Where do migraine attacks begin? It's not where does the pain come from, but where does the migraine attack begin? Oh, could I have my slides, please? Yeah, it should work. Ah, there it is. So, um, if we want to ask, answer this question, where do the migraine attack begin? We have to consider the earliest symptoms of the migraine attack. And my colleague and opponent here focused a lot on the pain phase of migraine, but we all know that migraine is so much more than pain. And you've seen this figure on and on again during this meeting. And really, if we listen to the patient carefully, the earliest symptoms are symptoms that we now refer to as program, previously premonitory symptoms, probably reported by the majority of patients. Next, followed by oral symptoms, reported, experienced by one third of patients. And then comes the pain. So all of this happens before the actual pain. And if we consider the programmable symptoms, these include symptoms such as excessive yawning, craving for certain foods, mood disturbances like feeling low or even feeling high and energetic. And I ask you now, many of you are clinicians like me, these symptoms, where do they originate from? From a blood vessel, peripheral nerve? 
in the Tibetan Vita, they originate from the brain. And we can discuss whether this is the hypothalamus or the limbic system or even the basal ganglia. We don't know for sure, but it's definitely the brain. We even have some excellent uh, neuroimaging data to support this, and we've seen this data before during this meeting. And uh, just to highlight a few famous studies, we have a study by uh, many young colleagues uh, of PET scans performed during GTA induced premonitory symptoms showing increased activity of the hypothalamus, also of the brainstem and cortical structures like the occipital lobes. And uh, also another study that has been highlighted by uh, Dr. Schulte from Hamburg of a single patient image using functional MRI every day for a month, showing a strikingly similar activation pattern during this pre or very early phase of the, the migraine attack of hypothalamic activation. They also found increased connectivity between the hypothalamus and the brainstem. We also did see this occipital activation. And um, we discussed about whether this patient actually had premonitory symptoms or not. Uh, I would say if this person did not have premonitory symptoms, this is a strong case for, even in that case, a central origin of mind attacks. We also discussed uh, reproducibility in neuroimaging. And we have not mentioned before that this finding has actually been reproduced by the authors. Uh, two years ago, they published a new series of seven patients imaged for every day for a month, and they found the same hypothalamic activation in their early phase of migraine. So based on the clinical presentation, based on neuroimaging data, we have to say that these symptoms originate from the brain, definitely. Next, we have the migraine orifice. And if you read the reference carefully here, you can see that this is a review I did on uh, the characteristics of migraine aura symptoms. And one of the co-authors is my colleague. So I think we can uh, agree that migraine aura symptoms originate from the brain and from the cerebral cortex. We also know the underlying mechanism, which is cortical spring depression, cortical depolarization beyond any reasonable doubt. And here you see it. This is a nice uh, images from the Jerry's Catholic brain of a pig, where you can see this propagation of spreading depression. And uh, I think it must be clear to you that this is a brain. This happens inside a brain. And this is before the onset of pain in my brain. In some cases, as we heard before, we can even pinpoint the exact site of origin of migraine attacks. In familiar hemiplegic migraine, we know the genes that are affected, we know the proteins that these genes encode. These are ion channels. So in FHM1, we have calcium channel in the neuron. FHM2 is a sodium potassium interface in astrocytes, which is very interesting. FHM3, and the sodium channels. This is in the brain. It happens in the brain. It starts in the brain. We also know how we get from spreading depression to the pain phase of migraine. Based on very good preclinical data, we know that spreading depression may lead to activation of meningeal nociceptors. All in all, it's clear that the first event of spontaneous migraine attacks happens in the CNS. This may give rise to premonitory symptoms, to oral symptoms, maybe to no symptoms at all in some patients. And subsequently, the CNS orchestrates an activation of the cardiovascular system in a very specific way, causing activation of peripheral nociceptors, release of neuropeptides, basal dilation, all of this causes pain. These painful signals, of course, go back into the CNS and it's perceived as pain. Now, what about um, provocation of migraine? Well, of course, we have some excellent human provocation models. We can use various substances to provoke migraine attacks. We don't know exactly where these substances work. 
Some of them may enter the CNS. We know that ETN crosses the brain barrier. Nip probably can be where yesterday also goes into the CNS. It may also be that the triggering part of these uh, human models is not exactly the same as what happens in spontaneous attacks. And as for the treatment, GDP antibodies, some would claim that they work centrally. I will not. I, I agree that they work in the periphery. They work on the pain, but this is not evidence of a peripheral origin of the migraine attack. In conclusion, if we consider the migraine attacks where we know the origin, we know the mechanisms of the origin, migraine with aura, remember the cortical spread of depression, migraine with initial symptoms that clearly arise from the CNS. Here we can say that this is a definite CNS origin. I will be conservative here and say that this accounts for roughly half of migraine attacks. <coughs> then we have the rest. We have migraine without aura, migraine with optimal symptoms. Then we can speculate. We can say that this would easily be a CNS origin. We have the same activation of the trigeminal vascular system. Good points to a central generator that triggers this. We don't really know. We have no evidence of a peripheral origin for these attacks. So if we have to decide either or, if we have to decide between central or peripheral, we have to decide based on evidence, based on confirmed evidence, the facts, not on speculation. And in that case, we have to say that migraine attacks have a central origin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're going to have the uh, second vote. Uh, to see how these uh, very nice talks uh, might have or might not have influenced uh, your view, and I think uh, we will start the voting. I should also grab my phone then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Hans, what is your opinion? Well, I don't know as a moderator if you're allowed to have an opinion. <laughs> uh, at least not until the votes have been final uh, casted. But uh, I think we can, maybe now that some of you are voting, we can continue a little bit into this uh, panel discussion as well. And I would like to start with a question that is actually a little bit to both of you, because mm. I think we all agree that CGRP is involved in my brain, at least. Uh, and then, uh, Dr. Do, how will you uh, picture the? Where is the CGRP coming from? If you have a pure peripheral view, what what starts, what what starts, or in, where where is CGRP included in in this view? Well, I know uh, a guy. His name is Edwards, and I think it's your mentor. He actually demonstrated this with ghost speed that geothermal stimulation can provoke or induce a release of CGRP from the nerve endings of the geothermal ganglion. So we already know that stimulation of a structure outside of the brain can induce release of CGRP. And this is also what we believe is one of the mechanisms involved in migraine uh, pain generation to begin with. And I think the, sa the same to you as well. Uh, uh, how, how is then the brain triggering this, uh, the CGRP uh, release? What's your view on, on this one? Well, we know that central mechanisms may in turn lead to activation of the trigeminovascular system, and this includes the release of CGRP peripherally. So, but at least, easy in, question. at least in my my view, this is also a little bit what we need to really establish how this how this works to be able to conclude on the final on the uh, on the pathways. But uh, yeah, I'm sure you have some questions for each other as well to to really start the mm -hmm. the fighting. But please don't get uh, get physical. <laughs> May I start as your junior? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you. So, 
first a brief comment and then I'll ask the question. Uh, <laughs> we already discussed premonitory symptoms yesterday, so I won't go too deep into that. I will just note that two thirds were against premonitory symptoms yesterday. Just keep this in mind. The, the hypothalamic origin, not against premonitory symptoms. It's still my turn on this. Sorry. <laughs> so I was, but half of your arguments related to colic spreading depression and aura. And this is a question for the entire audience, actually. Do all patients experience migraine aura? The answer is no. Approximately one third of patients will experience migraine aura, and not necessarily consistently for all of their attacks, but more occasionally or seldomly. Is this correct, Anas? One third of patients experience aura, that's correct. Yeah. And my next question for you is that, can you experience migraine aura without headache? Yes, definitely. So the aura and the cortical spread and depression leads to triggering of peripheral nociceptors ah. in most cases, but in some probably rare cases. This so is, so you're, this you're actually agreeing happen. that cortical spread and depression is merely another potential trigger of a migraine attack. That is not necessarily a prerequisite for a migraine attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So I, you said that these mechanisms were peripheral. I just heard you say the word peripheral. Is I, this correct? I say that not all migraine patients have aura and not all migraine patients have a cortical spreading depression. Okay, so we can agree on that cortical spreading depression can lead to a migraine attack, but it's not necessarily a prerequisite. And you can actually experience migraine aura without the headache. And the next part is that when it comes to, if you say that migraine aura leads to headache, then usually you would expect that the migraine aura consistently appears before the headache, right? But that's not always the case. I recall Professor Ashina actually showed this uh, on a slide yesterday. I think it was Ossel and Olsen's data. Some old data that showed that aura can actually occur after the headache, or in the middle of the headache, or without the headache at all. So I would argue that migraine aura is, I would say, is a very potent trigger of migraine attacks, but it's not a prerequisite for migraine attacks. This is very interesting, especially the the headache before aura patients. And uh, in all of the migraine literature, there are only two studies assessing the frequency of this phenomenon. One is the aforementioned paper by Michael Russell and uh, Jesolusen from 1996 in Brain. And uh, then there's a more recent study by our good friend Michele Viana. And they agree that this is a very rare phenomenon. In the Olesen study, it was less than 3% of patients. So maybe this is a very special subgroup of migraine or a patient, but I, I, my take on this is that um, headache may start during the aura phase. That's not unusual. So we have aura and then before the aura is gone, you start having a headache. And in my clinical experience, many patients do not notice the very early part of their aura symptoms. So they have their visual aura sneaking in on them, and then maybe after 10 minutes, they notice, whoa, something is going on in my visual field. So to me, those very rare cases, they are probably patients who do not notice their very early aura symptoms. So they have a spreading depression, and then they have head pain. Can I just ask you one thing in, in the same line, uh, Anders, when you say peripheral origin, because do you believe that the brain itself generates these uh, migraine attacks without any peripheral input? I know it, it's a bit wider definition of yeah. peripheral origin, but uh, <coughs> a view on that? That's a different viewpoint, that's not my viewpoint. What some expert would claim that uh, the peripheral is, is not abnormal in any way, we have the usual peripheral input, but it's just process in a pathological way by the CNS. I don't say that. I say that we still have no susceptive input from the periphery. But the origin is in the CNS. Can I follow up with a question on that? Yeah. Because you say that the aura occurs or causing spreading depression occurs before the headache. But can you induce migraine aura through a peripheral event? I don't think so. Well, I would think so, because we have data supporting this. So as we argued earlier, CHRP most likely does not cross the blood-brain barrier, right? So it must act 
at the peripheral side, most likely vascular because we see at least there's a vasodilation, so we know this much. I know that if you give CCRP to patients with migraine with aura, you will see some of them will have migraine aura, approximately one third of them. And that's through a peripheral stimulus. You can also give a corrosive puncture. You also see it in stroke and CCI and so on. Surely, I cannot exclude there's also some, especially for stroke and so on, essential effect, but we know that peripheral events can induce a migraine aura. So it's not so simple that you says that you say that CSD leads to headache because we have events, peripheral events, leading to CSD. Yeah, but you don't know for sure that these are peripheral events. So, CGRP induced aura. That's highly controversial. We have four cases in the literature. They could not be reproduced when I tried to provoke them afterwards. And maybe CGRP crosses the blood-brain barrier to some extent. We don't know. Maybe they affect central neurons. Uh, actually, that was a nice systematic review that was published a couple of months ago by a uh, by Vigas and colleagues that demonstrated that CGRP most likely do not cross the blood-brain barrier. The thing is that everything crosses the blood-brain barrier to some extent, even antibodies that are a huge molecule. And you don't know, this is not an either-or, it's not dichotomous. If something crosses the blood-brain barrier a little bit, it might exert an effect centrally that's efficient. But that's not the case here, so I, I don't think that CGRP triggers cortical spring depression via a peripheral mechanism. And as for the vascular uh, pathology causing uh, aura, this, this is probably due to hypoperfusion or microembolization, which will trigger spray depression. We know that from experiments of animals and from, also from human studies. So there's no, I'm, I'm not very uh, <laughs> impressed by these arguments, I will say. Mm, are there any evidence of any cyclicity that you could link to also as a peripheral origin? <clears throat> uh, because you see a lot of changes in the cycles uh, of, of the migraines, and I think in that way it might support the changes in, the, uh, in a lot of the input also in the CNS. But, but what could be cyclic triggers in the, you in think the periphery? You're thinking about peroxys, why, why we have an episodic passing with migraine? Or yes, exactly. The, the episodic, tri I think that, that possibly is easier to explain with the CNS feature, but do you have any input on how that could be explained in the, in the peripheral feature? Well, there are uh, channelopathies, genetic channelopathies that can present with episodic pain. And at the moment, we have evidence suggesting that migraine uh, attacks, at least to a certain extent, is dependent on uh, iron channels. This was demonstrated by Alcagoli and colleagues. And we also have updated supporting that, again, as you mentioned, FHM. But I would say HFM is not representative of the common migraine. First of all, uh, we rarely see patients who have hemiplegia, ataxia, and other symptoms you may see in FHM. And second, they do not respond the same way to common, typical migraine uh, treatments. So some might say they gave an idea of what can give a migraine attack, but they're definitely not representative of 99% of migraine attacks. May I comment? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So FHM is not the typical migraine, but it's definitely migraine. And symptomatology, apart from motor symptoms and all these special symptoms, are the same. We have the same headache and so on. And now, based on this new meta-analysis, we even see that the CACNA 1A gene is also affected in migraine with aura, migraine with typical aura. So I think I agree that migraine is a channelopathy, but it's a channelopathy of central neurons. Could I ask a question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Dr. Do, would you say that migraine is not a brain disorder? That's a good question. Depends on how you define brain disorder. I know, that, I, 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 the brain. Yeah, I, I know the brain prize was given to a migraine last year, but that does not necessarily mean Should the recipients the uh, give the prize back? <laughs> yes, Olsen, what do you think? Do you want to give the prize back? <laughs> <laughs> and you might even have to change your whole department because it might be internal medicine or something. Like that, so <laughs> I don't know if we want to go down that, uh, <laughs> that line of arguments. 
No, I would say that migraine is definitely dependent on both central and peripheral structures. I do agree with that. The pain perception happens inside of the cortex. I cannot deny that. But we're talking about how do they originate, what starts a migraine attack. And if we look at, if you take the, the rare disease case as an algorithm, I'm just returning a bit back to the FHM, we also have vasculopathies uh, presenting with migraine attacks as a typical symptom like catacele, amylase, or other rare diseases. And that's in blood vessels, right? That's a vasculopathy. So if we take rare diseases, we also have rare diseases that are driven by peripheral mechanisms that present with migraine attacks. Yeah, but it, the migraine attacks of catacel and milas, they are migraine attacks with aura, and they are dependent on central blood vessels causing central affection of the cortex leading to cortical spinal depression. Mm -hmm. That's pretty well documented. But again, I'm just saying that it is possible to have vascular events, again, as I mentioned earlier, that can lead to CSD. Absolutely, you can have a stroke that leads to a CSD. That's in the brain. I will uh, just, how much time do we have again? Uh, we're, we're moving on, I think, also to the, some questions can from have, the audience. Can I have one last question? I think like you'll you be interested have, in this one. Okay, you can have one, ah. one last one. <laughs> so we were talking about CGRP earlier. So, so what happens when you give CGRP to a smooth muscle cell? We know it, that's some vasodilation going on. And that's a hyperpolarization, right? So if you give CGRP within the CNS and hyperpolarize the cell, what would you expect then? Increase firing or decrease firing? Decrease firing. And actually, we have animal data showing that if you apply CGRP within the brain, you can have an anti-nociceptive effect and not a nociceptive effect. Mm. So if CGRP is supposed to work within the CNS, how do you then explain this? I don't say that CGRP is released within the CNS. I say that the CNS causes CGRP to be released in the periphery. But, but I, think, I think also just one comment on that one. It's also a little bit on the difference of pathways because you have the hyperpolarization pathways with the beta-gamma subunits as well for CGRP, but you also have the cyclic AMP pathway. And in the smooth muscle cells, that will always lead to vasodilation. But when you go into the CNS, cyclic AMP can have many different effects that we might not know. It can also potentially lead to uh, depolarization or hypersensitivity of events. So I think that makes it a little bit tricky to, <laughs> yeah, a little bit tricky to, to conclude exactly what CGRP is doing in, in the neurons and how they are, what they are expressing. And uh, as you can see, we are now open also to uh, some questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, do we have extra microphone up for the audience? Or um, if not, I can come up with mine and, and run it for them. Thank you for uh, both of you. Nice uh, presentation. Uh, I have uh, three questions to uh, Dr. Du. <laughs> 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 I, I was paid beforehand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> by, by him? <laughs> <laughs> the first question, Dr. Du. You started with the anatomical structure of the brain and where the pain uh, started. You mentioned that we cannot induce pain by stimulating intracerebral structure. Is that true? Because Ray and Wolf showed that if you distend the ventricles, you will actually induce headache. And the ventricle system is quite inside the brain, <laughs> right? So this is the first question. I need your comments on that. The second question, I like that. Uh, discussion about CGRB antibodies and whether CGRB antibodies cross the, the PPP. But how sure are we about that? Because we don't not know that for, for real, you know, and we know that we have uh, 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 antibodies, uh, IgG and IgM uh, in the uh, 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 C, uh, C, uh, SCSF, you know, we, we know, that we know there is some production in the peripheral system which cross the, the PPP. And all what we know about the BBB is actually from preclinical models. We don't know that for sure in human. So I think my personal opinion that we might see in the future that there is a, a cross of the CGRB antibodies in the uh, central nervous system. Or do we know, is there any study now measuring CGRB antibodies 
uh, in patients treated with CGRP antibodies in the CSF, uh, for example. This is uh, 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 the second question. And the third question is, can you remember them or should I wait? For no, you? We'll go on, go on. Okay, you no, 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 please ask, ask the third question. The, the third question is uh, the, the, the discussion you had with uh, Dr. Go, uh, with Dr. Uh, uh, Bogot about uh, high polarization. CGRB itself might be anti nociceptive when you apply it directly to the brain. I agree. But it's because of the high polarization on all neurons, or maybe because CGRB inhibits inhibitory neurons and you can go. You know that, that yeah, happened. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. How much did you pay him again? <laughs> <laughs> <That's it. laughs> okay, I, I think I'll take it back. What's um, so regarding the, the inhibi inhibition of inhibitory effect, of course, we cannot exclude this effect. I completely agree with you, Dr. Al Kalgoli. But but fact is that we have studies demonstrating that we can have an antinosis effect where apply CGRP to the brain. So whether it's a double negative or positive or how many layers you know, may want to add, the physiological uh, outcome is anti nociception right? Second, regarding CGRP antibodies, there has been made a study with galcanosumab, if I recall correctly, where it investigated how much, uh, how much of this antibody was distributed within the blood-brain barrier or within the brain. And it showed that it was a minuscule, I think it was less than 1%. Sure, that's a tiny bit, but in general, I think you should look at what the big part is, right? You don't want the little slice of the pizza, you want the, you know, the rest of it, at least I want it, but I'm also getting a bit hungry right now. So most likely, the, the site of action of antibodies are outside of the brain because that's where most of it is, right? And in addition, another argument that can be used there is related to, let's say, sumatriptan. We, both, we know that, we know that Sumatriptan for sure have a peripheral side of action because we see vasoconstriction, right? But again, I cannot exclude that there's also a central effect because we have uh, sometimes have some adverse events that can be related to the CNS and also because there was this receptor study by a guy doc called Dr. Hugard with uh, Dr. Dane some time ago that showed that there maybe was some receptor affinity. But again, just because it is able to bind within the CNS that does not necessarily mean that that's the, uh, what can I say, that the side of action for its mechanism. It might just be, sure, it can give an adverse event, but let's look at the clinical effect, what is relevant, and that's the pain relief. We know that vasoconstriction is associated with pain relief. Is this correct, Dr. al -Kabuli? Would you agree with this? He, he nods, he nods. And then the, fir the first question asked me was related to the dissension of ventricles. Again, that might be an indirect effect of the structures around because again, the ventricle system, you would know, you would teach anatomy, is quite big. You would agree on that? And if you look at the Italian data that came later, or more recently, you see that the, the main structure that gave pain were the cerebral arteries. Not the ventricles, not the pancreas, the arteries. Sure, there might be other structures, but the main, the main focal point are the arteries here. Please ask a question to Dr. Huber at this time. <laughs> well, I will put a third notion, and I, will, uh, I would like to uh, you both response to that. And I will say that there um, is not peripheral, not central, but it, it could be a third uh, uh, origin of my brain. So if you look at the abdominal pain in infants, uh, cyclic vomiting and the effect of sumatriptan and the whole microbiome that producing the different nerve receptors and the huge amount of beta CGRP and GAN system and the hormonal influence. Um, so isn't it possible? Uh, I would like to hear your uh, ideas that it is nor proper central, not the brain, but it is from the gut system. Can I start? Go ahead. Well, 
the gut is outside of the brain. So if I have to continue down this road, I might as well go, as well go full in. <laughs> That's my comment on that. No, I, I agree that there are many exogenous, uh, what can I say, things that may affect the migraine threshold, be it hormonal, be it through diet or other potential uh, factors like stress. But again, we're not talking about what can change the threshold. We're talking about what actually induces the attack. That would be my comment. And I do not think that this is related to the gut or the microbiome or other parts uh, in that area. Well, I, I agree, actually. I mean, that these syndromes, cyclic vomiting and uh, abdominal migraine, they're rather controversial in their pediatric symptoms. But this whole uh, brain-gut connection is very interesting. And it might be that just as the brain is able to activate peripheral structures in the head, maybe it's also able to activate structures in the gut. Who knows? But, um, this question is really an example of how one should not ask because it says the origin of migraine attacks. Now, since 1988, it's been clear that we should distinguish between migraine with aura and migraine without aura. We can't lump them. Because it's so obvious that migraine with aura originates in the brain. It can't be denied. It's obvious. There's great depression and so on. So, so actually, the question should have been, does the migraine attack without aura originate centrally or peripherally? And if we phrase the question like that, I think that uh, I must have a, a little bit uh, difficult time because uh, if you say that the migraine without aura originates in the brain, that you also automatically say that all our provocation experiments since 1992 and uh, including the ones that research group has been doing for many years now, they are not valid for spontaneous migraine attacks because these substances don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So I, I, I'm very happy that you agree that one thing we can be certain of is that some migraine attacks originate in the brain, with no doubt. And the next question is, uh, what is the mechanism of these uh, migraine-inducing agents? Well, I truly believe that these induce genuine migraine attacks that share the pathophysiology of spontaneous migraine attacks, but they, they may mimic what the CNS does in the spontaneous attacks. So just like cortical sprain depression may lead to trigeminal vascular activation, CGRP release. If you give the CGRP directly, you bypass this initial mechanism. You work downstream, so to say. You go directly to the attack. So if you notice that we discussed about migraine with aura and CGRP, but generally if you give CGRP to migraine with aura patients, you don't get the aura phase. You get the headache, the headache phase of migraine. Um, so it seems that using these mechanisms bypasses the initial spontaneous mechanisms of mind. I agree with almost everything you said, especially about the part that provoke migraine attacks are the same as spontaneous migraine attacks. Because in the end, spontaneous migraine attacks are also, uh, so to say, provoked by external stimulus, let's say menstrual migraine. No one in this room, hopefully, would argue that menstrual migraine is not true migraine attacks just because it's related to a, a in this case, endogenous factors such as hormonal uh, changes, right? We will still argue it's a true migraine attack. Wouldn't you agree on us? Before you agree too much, I think we should jump to the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Jim, and I'm with the Danish Center. I have a question for Jim. So um, we keep saying that OGRP works in the periphery at the same time, but the multiple antibodies also work in the periphery. How come the patients that actually report they have the effect of the monoclonal antibodies say that they sometimes experience the same symptoms that they would experience in a migraine attack, but without the actual migraine pain, like the headache pain that they 
experience, but they still report that they have the same like symptoms or that, like the associated symptoms or the other symptoms that they would usually have in the case of a uh, malignant attack. That's th that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. So let's take the most common associated symptom, which is photophobia. So photophobia is hypersensitivity to light, right? But in the criteria, it's not really particularly demonstrated or, or defined what that actually means. There are several definitions of photophobia. You have oculodynia, pain in the eye. You can have true hypersensitivity to light. And then, then, then that's the one that is most commonly reported by patients with migraine. And that is exacerbation of headache by light. So in the end, this associated symptom is actually relying on the pain. And as we agreed on earlier, the pain is driven by peripheral input. So as such, these associated symptoms are related to the pain. And you made a, an assumption that a lot of patients say that they still have these associated symptoms, but without the pain after treatment. But this has never been systematically investigated. So we actually don't know for sure. These are anecdotes at the moment. And likewise, I will go back to the premonitory discussion from yesterday. Likewise, for premonitory symptoms, the, the evidence for this is also quite vague because at the moment there's more than 100 symptoms that has been defined in the literature related to this so-called premonitor phase or prodromal phase. And, and a lot of these symptoms also occur without attacks like yawning and fatigue. I will guarantee you I will have fatigue after this discussion, but that does not mean I have a migraine attack. And they're again quite common in the general population. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think we continue to the uh, closing uh, remarks. So you will have a few minutes each just to really give the, the punchline to convince the audience to, uh, to change their mind or to uh, keep their mind, depending on, of course, uh, their views to start off with. All right. So my closing remarks will be a reservation of my first arguments. Again, peripheral anatomy, peripheral provocation, peripheral treatment. The arguments that Alans have provided today have been re related to migraine aura, but as we can agree on, migraine aura is not a prerequisite for migraine attacks. You can have migraine attacks without aura, and you can have migraine aura without headache. In this case, I would argue that aura is simply a very potent trigger of migraine attacks or migraine without aura because it's quite related, quite close, like close related anatomically to the human vascular system. But that does not mean that it is a prerequisite. So if we look at the heart data related to migraine without aura, that accounts for most of migraine attacks that occur in this world. Peripheral anatomy, peripheral provocation, peripheral treatment. Ah, there it is. Thank you. So I think this has been a very interesting debate and I think that this is um, a very exciting time to be in the field of migraine science because well, there are a few things that we know for a fact and there are so many things that we don't know yet that we are starting to understand. And some of the things that we know for a fact is that some migraine attacks originate in the CNS. They have a central origin. And then we are starting to understand what happens with the rest of these attacks. We can speculate, we can debate, but if we want to decide based on the current evidence, we have to agree that some migraine attacks, maybe most of migraine attacks, originate in the CMS. That's what we know for now. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, the both of you. And now we will have the third and the uh, final vote, if we can get it up on the, on the screen and then we can finally decide a, a winner and then I think we can say that we don't need to have this debate again. Uh, <laughs> it will continue for <laughs> centuries. <laughs> so Hannes, you are the moderator, right? <clears throat> so Very impartial. Very impartial and I think after the voting is done maybe you can give your input on it. Yeah, after the voting then I, I, might, be, uh, I might be tempted into doing <clears throat> that. Just, uh, one question when we're waiting for the vote to on us. Is it possible to get prophylactic uh, effects of taking triptans? I know you shouldn't use it clinically, but is mm. it a, 
is do they potentially work in that way? I think so. Yeah, we we sometimes use it for short term prophylaxis for in pure menstrual micro. And, and, and if so, how do they then work if the brain starts the attack? Well, as Jen mentioned, um, cryptins have a central effect. They, they go into the CNS, they cause CNS side effects. We also know that um, specific 1F agonists, the titans, most likely have a central effect. There, but they have severe central side effects. So uh, I've Honestly, I believe that tryptins work both in the periphery and in the CNS. Um, and there's no evidence against a, a central effect of the tryptins that they could easily work in this way by modulating CNS. But, but I, would, I would argue that's more data showing that is driven by peripheral mechanism. First time demonstrated that it was a well, there's partially the release of peptides that gets inhibited, but also communication between first and second order neuron. And that's, and that's data and not speculations. Yeah, and uh, what about the, the dietins? Well, the 5-HT1F receptor is also located outside of the brain. Sure, we see a lot of adverse events, but that just means it's maybe not the first line of yeah. drug we should offer our patients based on the side effect profile. And you mentioned that the vasodilation and the vasoconstriction caused by the therapy is very important. What about the one No, I said it was associated they, uh, with they it. they constrict the <laughs> arteries? Uh... No, they do not necessarily, not necessarily. But the problem is that we don't have this drug in IV form, so we can test it in humans. I think also before the final vote is revealed. Yeah, I think uh, that uh, we cannot influence that. But <laughs> what, I, what I found interesting is that uh, about this discussion, although I agree with yes that uh, we should uh, kind of distinguish between migraine with and without Torah, <coughs> but I disagree a little bit with the motion here. And the reason for that, what I hope to hear from you, is that when we do the provocation studies, and we've done it for many years, it seems that patients with a single phenotype of migraine with aura, okay, they claim that they never suffer from migraine without aura, when we provoke those attacks, and we try to provoke migraine attacks in those patients, they develop migraine attacks without aura. And the question is, what is origin of those attacks? Because they don't get aura symptoms, but they get migraine attacks without aura. Is it peripheral or is it central? It's not only the, with the GTN, we also tried to the packup, we didn't publish that, but we have some data showing that there's no attacks <coughs> after the packup. I mean, there's still some open questions, we will see something in the future, but until now, only lepromacaline by Dr. Al Karakoli was shown to induce attacks in addition to the majority of the patients develop attacks without aura, correct, Mohammed? Mohammed, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. maybe you sleep, I don't you know. You said the majority. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they, they develop attacks, but attacks without aura, right? <coughs> yeah. So this is a question, this is a very interesting question. And uh, how can we explain that? So maybe we should be very provocative on us and say, I'm not sure about that, that Aura is something else. It's not really migraine. I know that your Yasulison doesn't like that. But maybe it's just a trigger. Trigger of migraine attacks without aura. Since it takes place in the brain, it's a brain, cortex brain depression, with a close proximity to the vascular system. In this case, is, it is as a trigger as a menstrual cycle. It's kind of parallel. What do you think about that? It's pure speculation, but <laughs> based on something, it's actually, we have some data suggesting that no attacks of aura after the triggers. So what, what this means, so you, you, can, you could theoretically provoke a migraine aura by causing a, a cortical lesion. <coughs> so in, in a patient who does not have migraine in the first place, if you provoke migraine aura, would that also lead to the headache phase of, of migraine effect? I mean, 
what, what we know that the aura can be triggered also by different mechanisms. Please correct me, yes, in the old days they also puncture the, the, the femoral artery when they're doing the, uh, the, the angiography imaging, right? Yep. And they provoked aura symptoms. Yep. In this they all, you also injected in the carotids here, yeah. you produced aura mechanisms, so it kind of coming. There are also some claims of the PFO pattern for Amano Valley. Uh, it's a bit also controversial, but we see some patients reporting that after the closure, they stop having the aura symptoms. So meaning that it can also come something from outside and trigger the aura symptoms. By the way, the most of the cases without headache, just aura symptoms. Mm. So maybe it's something different, maybe it's something in parallel. Of course, it's not a discussion, your discussion, not today, but still, I think it's relevant. Yeah. Sure. So I'm, I'm only probably talking about trigger and how was trigger, or are we going talking about pathways? So there are different starting points. Starting for, points. Yeah, I think that's better than yeah. it's trigger. Yeah, as a starting point, you're absolutely right. So the, the difference, that, and there's no doubt about it, the oral symptoms, of course, explain depression. And at least what we know also, we have a direct measurements with the people with a brain injury that you can have. But apparently, it's a very difficult to induce oral symptoms. And uh, we have to agree is that we were very surprised when we saw Mohammed's results. And that's why we need to reproduce them, and we are working on it now. Not in the same patients, but different patients. Andreas is doing that. So, uh, because it is quite unusual. So far, we were not successful in inducing uh, aura, except with hypoxia. But hypoxia, it's, it's very, I would say, it's very <laughs> dirty. I'm it's many processes. Yeah, it's, it's a different, something different. But for the triggering, so maybe it's uh, something else. Oh, how much? Sure, go Three questions were not enough? <laughs> oh, this is discussion now. <laughs> I know that we have to close, right? Uh, uh, also for uh, Professor Ashina, the question is, how would you compare a triggering migraine with triggering a cluster headache? You can also, there, there are a lot of common links between cluster and migraine. And we also succeed by triggering cluster a patient in episodic cluster, but we couldn't trigger the cluster headache in patients in remission. So if the brain turn off all the pathways, you are not able to trigger, trigger anything. How can we explain that? One of the explanation would be, there is a very rare genetic disease, which is a pure peripheral. It's a Colombian family is suffering from the one of mutations, I don't remember exactly which one. And those patients, they experience excruciating on and off pain in the upper part of the body. And guess what, Mohammed? Before they start having those attacks, they report prodromes. And it's pure peripheral, right? I'm sure that if you have a bad stomach, you may also have some kind of prodromes. Right. Uh, what do you think, Kashmar? Do you agree with that? Gap and brain connection. So uh, I think that uh, it is a fascinating and interesting debate. And I agree with you, Anas. Uh, we are not going to be unemployed <laughs> in the next uh, 20, 30 years, something like that. And probably 10 years from now, we will still discuss about that. And uh, before we stop here, yes, uh, with your experience uh, in, in my field, uh, the concept about my abdominal migraine. What do you think about that? Uh, you've seen so many patients. Uh, what is your experience with this abdominal migraine? And have you tried triptans in this patient? I don't have much experience. It's extremely rare in adults, and I don't see children. But uh, it, judging from the literature, I think it's a very uncertain thing there. There are only these studies by Abu Arafi from Edinburgh where they showed that children with these syndromes have a higher prevalence when they get older than 
children who don't have it, but uh, I think we need more evidence to actually link it to migraine. Thank you. Sorry. Started all this after the vote was already finished, so it will <coughs> not influence any of us. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> smart move. So let's see if we have some uh, results that are uh, ready. Oh! oh. Wow! Wow! <laughs> It's a pretty bad uh, standpoint. <laughs> exactly. And uh, for me, at least, when it comes to the, some final remarks also in, uh, in the origin, I think the key question that will really help answering this is where does the CGRP come from in the first place in genuine attacks? And if we find out where it comes from, that will be a huge part in understanding. Is it triggered from some parts in the CNS leading to this release? Or is there something in the periphery from the trigeminal ganglion or from the vessels that trigger the release. And if we know where the CGRP comes from, I think that's really the crucial part that we, uh, we need to go from. And, and when those evidence are there, I will give my final...